uh, as I mentioned, this study, um, it um, uh, uh, it um, uh, was uh, uh, a part of a bigger project dealing with Sweden's membership in the European Union 25 years since the accession in 1995. Uh, so there were a number of issues regarding also economic policy and many other issues published last year. And this one was published then in, uh, in November, I think. Uh, so it's uh, one year old. And I can be glad to discuss with you what happened the, the last year. There's still a lot of things going on in European chemical policy, but the report itself deals with the developments up to 2020. Uh, and just a few words about how this study was done. It's based on uh, more than 50 interviews with uh, key players of different kinds, both Swedish and in other European countries. It is people in government, in the commission, in ECA, but also people in, uh, in uh, industry uh, and in uh, different kinds of organizations, uh, environmental organizations, uh, some trade union and, and other in the civil society. And uh, it is not, I would say, um, uh, very strict scientific report. It doesn't use a very uh, explicit analytic framework, but it does build on both uh, political science theory regarding what political scientists often refer to as Europeanization, how member states are affected by being members of the European Union, and also on theory regarding political processes, uh, such as the multiple stream framework and then the coalition uh, framework for those who are familiar with political science. I've also written a, a book about environmental uh, case studies uh, that goes a bit deep, deeper into the theory part, and we can discuss that later if you're interested in, in that. But basically this report more tells the story about Swedish chemical policy and the relation to the EU level and how some of this uh, might be explained. So uh, I'll um, start with this uh, picture, which uh, um, takes a long time perspective. Uh, and I think that's one insight also on looking at other policy processes that things you are in the middle of for some reason, uh, as uh, Donald said, I was myself uh, in policy making in the 1990s. And uh, you, you, of course, are most aware of what happens around you in the specific time when you are active. But chemical policy, like other policy areas, has a long prehistory. There is path dependence. And there are also people who have been working for a very long time setting their mark on developments. So just go very briefly through this. Um, uh, of course, chemicals policy in some sense is very old. Uh, there was an awakening during the 1960s in Sweden, like in other countries, uh, which is kind of start of modern chemicals policy with a law in 1973 in Sweden. Uh, there was also from the very early start a strong international policy element of Swedish uh, activities here with an OECD meeting 1978 in Stockholm that intensified the OECD work where Sweden was also very active. Um, and this development continued um, also nationally. And I think to start with that, one interesting uh, aspect is the relationship between science, um, uh, authority, agency, experts, bureaucrats, if you like, in some sense, and the political level, because there was a big change between and policy developments uh, in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, where the um, uh, social democrats who have been in power for a very long time after the Second World War lost government power, but then they developed policy uh, in opposition. And they did that by drawing on expertise from trade unions, working environment was a big issue for the start of chemical policy. So they brought in experts in that field and they developed then a, a, a policy that was then transferred in 1982 when they took power to a government commission, which presented the basis for a modern chemical policy 
and this government commission, the secretariat were some people who had been very active from the start, uh, like Bo Wallström, who was a key person in the OCD work, and others from, uh, from uh, the predecessor to the chemicals, uh, uh, National Chemicals Agency, GME. So this was a kind of a, um, combination of this political will to do something about this uh, hot political issue that it was in the uh, 1970s, 1980s, and also to draw on the expertise that was already there, and that was in its turn based on a strong scientific base. So um, Sweden developed this um, uh, rather far-reaching national chemicals policy in the 1980s, also with an independent government agency, the Swedish Chemicals Agency, your National Chemicals Inspectorate, as it was known, um, which also was founded in 1986 together with more modern legislation. There was also, uh, from the beginning in this uh, uh, chemicals agency, a strong international component, which also um, was reflected in the role Sweden had at the Rio conference in 92. And if one goes back to the uh, section of Agenda 21 adopted in Rio dealing with chemicals, you can see some of the language there, for example, on uh, phasing out uh, persistent uh, and yet by uh, cumulative and uh, toxic substances already reflected in this re declaration in 1992. Of course, there was not only because of Sweden, but Sweden was one of the driving countries uh, behind this. And then there was a big change with the uh, integration with the European Union, and first with the agreement on the European economic area, which was really the uh, major, I would say, adaptation to European legislation because Sweden became part of the internal market. But then also later on with the accession negotiation leading up to Sweden's membership in 1995. And uh, chemicals were a controversial issue in this context since um, Sweden had higher standards in a number of areas. Uh, this was also a hotly contested issue in the national policy debate about the EU membership, whether Sweden would have to lower its standard or not. And the result, the outcome was that Sweden could keep its higher standards in specific fields for four years while there was a review of European uh, policy in these areas. So uh, this was the big issue for the government. Uh, needed to show the public that it was successful during this review process and that was a political reason for devoting a lot of energy in these first years of EU membership to uh, chemicals policy. And uh, the result, we can discuss that if some of you are interested, but uh, this study uh, based on the interviews, uh, uh, I did uh, uh, results in the conclusion that uh, generally speaking, there was not a lowering of standards. In some cases, the EU raised the standards. Then you can discuss specific issues like the substitution principle that was introduced in the Swedish legislation before the accession and how the uh, possibilities to use that has been changed by the membership. Uh, if you like, we can come back to that issue. Uh, but basically, uh, it was not a lowering of, of standards. Uh, but this uh, then uh, driving force to influence the EU uh, chemical policy was not only reflected in the specific fields where there were this uh, specific arrangement I talked about, like ban on cadmium and some other substances, but there was also, also work to influence the whole EU uh, chemicals uh, policy. And uh, uh, this was done um, by uh, at the national level to to um, produce a big government report on how uh, chemicals policy needed to be changed. And it was also uh, done through alliance building with other member states. I will come back a little to that. Now, I'm not quite sure if you can see the rest of this timetable here in my screen. I see, I see uh, maybe you can, as I did, move the picture of me speaking there if you couldn't see the whole. Uh, picture, uh, but uh, uh, then uh, there was an impetus to have a new uh, 
chemicals policy in the EU, as you are aware, uh, I guess. And uh, uh, this was also something where Sweden played an important role. Um, there were council conclusions uh, in 1999 on the need for a new chemicals policy. There was the REACH proposal from the European Commission. And one thing I found interesting that I was not that aware of uh, was also that um, it was a very clear uh, ambition of the Swedish government that the new commissioner in 1999 should have environment as its uh, as an area of responsibility. So uh, two sources, uh, and they are named in this report, uh, including Margaret Wallström herself, says that it was not, it was very clear that it was environment. So, so you could see that as a way of really also prioritizing environment in, in the European policy in general, that this was the portfolio the government really wanted and uh, the ambition to get. And as many of you know, uh, uh, there were many Swedes involved in the REACH uh, process, both Margaret Wallström as commissioner, but also civil servants in the commission, uh, rapporteurs and others in the European Parliament. Uh, and there was uh, almost complaints that there were too many Swedes involved in this. And while talking about this uh, then, uh, change of EU chemical policy, of course, there were also many others involved. Civil society was doing uh, many activities uh, and there were other member states as well. I'll come back a little to that. Uh, but uh, since the topic here is about uh, Sweden and the European Union, I'm focusing on that. And then there was a phase uh, with the implementation of REACH, which took a lot of time and work. And uh, then with the uh, subsequent uh, analysis that there were weaknesses in the REACH legislation and in the other parts of this uh, uh, new chemicals policy and calls for the commission to come forward with a revised chemical policy or a new chemicals policy, which uh, took some time. Uh, and now perhaps we can discuss that. Maybe we are now in a new um, window of opportunity. If the 1990s was a window of opportunity in European environmental policy making, as uh, I would say, for a number of reasons, maybe the Green Deal is now uh, a new kind of wind of opportunity. And uh, Sweden has once again pushed for this new chemical strategy uh, together with others. And we will see now how it develops so with the council conclusions that were adopted during the Portuguese presidency now in March, and also with the work program for next year's at, at least listing two uh, proposals, the revision of the CLP directive, classification labeling, and pesticide directive, and on the sustainable use of pesticides. This is a very short summary of a very long story. I'm sure we can discuss a lot about this. Uh, but I, I wanted to say something more general than about this uh, relation between Sweden and the EU during this time. And uh, as I said, uh, it's interesting to observe the long-term effort starting in the 1970s really and especially in the late 1970s early 1980s uh, with some principles that were there uh, already from that time about the responsibility for the producers to provide information uh, and about um, the right for consumers to receive this information and also about the phasing out of especially harmful substances and a number of other principles, also including the precautionary principle, for example. Um, and using these windows of opportunity, I think that uh, conforms with some theory on political processes. And in the 1990s, there was, uh, in the European Union, many uh, center-left governments. There was three new member states. Uh, coming in with Austria, Sweden, and Finland that had progressive agenda. And there were institutional allies for a strong environmental policy within the commission, for example, that wanted to use this enlargement also as an occasion of strengthening policy. It was also from a more structural point of view, a time where the internal market was implemented. And this also was a driving force to harmonizing 
more legislation and also showing perhaps that the European Union was about also other aspects than the pure uh, internal market issues. Uh, another interesting issue also if you compare to other parts of environmental policy and other policy areas is the strong role of the Swedish chemical agency in this field uh, where not being a very big agency they have still been able to combine this ambitious national policy work with the uh, European uh, Union uh, level and the international level. Uh, leadership, I will come back to that. Uh, I think that's something that is perhaps not always so much studied in political process uh, analysis when it comes to environment, uh, but this has been important with many uh, Swedes pushing for stronger chemicals policy and in particular very many women doing this. There's also kind of a gender aspect of that. Uh, but also that this has to be built on a strong scientific base and many of the interviews with people who are not Swedes uh, about the influence Sweden has had on, on EU policy making has have emphasized that proposals have often been well found and scientifically and it has also been the case of for example, experts from the chemical agency not proposing things if they are not to uh, have a strong uh, scientific base. Uh, so sometimes uh, they have gained in confidence by really looking for the scientific base. I'm sure this is something it says, since you are the real expert on this, uh, that you might have views on as well. And finally, uh, it's also interesting to look at the interlinkages between these different uh, policy processes, the national, the European, and the global uh, level. Uh, yes, I asked for briefly, I think it's interesting uh, also as an example of what critical scientists call uploading of policy to look at what happened in Chester in 1990 eight when five member states then pushed for a new chemicals policy, three new member states and two rather old member states, Denmark and the Netherlands, who then at this informal council meeting put forward a number of the principles that were the basis then for what became REACH. We can then discuss how much has this uh, 25 years been a success for Sweden and others wanting to reform EU uh, chemicals policy. Well, um, REACH is a comprehensive system, uh, looking globally, it's hard to find anybody saying that there is uh, any other part of the world being as ambitious. Uh, one important area that I, I write about uh, is what has ha happened in the area of pesticides, uh, not discussed that often perhaps, uh, but uh, this has also been a very significant change for Sweden has played an important role. And you can look at specific substances such as mercury or the PFAS group where Sweden has played an important role. Or on the concept side about uh, introducing non-toxic material cycles as a policy goal and linking waste policy, circular economic policy to chemical policy. But you can, of course, also say that uh, if you look at the problem as such from a health and environment view, there are still much too many substances that are not dealt with on a uh, sufficient way. If you look at the slow pace of the candidate list in reach, for example, mm -hmm. uh, this idea or commitment that I mentioned from the Rio conference already about phasing out uh, uh, long-term pollutants is still a far way from happening. Uh, and an interesting also part is the use of pesticides where Sweden was a very progressive country at the start of the EU membership after having uh, reduced the use of pesticides uh, a lot nationally where it is uh, perceived and you can also see that from uh, uh, official documents that Sweden is not so uh, pushing anymore uh, within the European Union on reducing the use as such of all pesticides as before. And uh, uh, Sweden has this environmental goal of a uh, toxic free environment and, and uh, assessments say that is far away from that. So you can look at the glass as half full or half empty, but if you prefer to look at the successes, and I think this is important to learn from success, I'll just briefly talk about some of the uh, 
success factors. Uh, and um, one, as I mentioned, has been the strong scientific support. Another has been the political will really to achieve uh, change. The skillful administration I already talked about. Uh, when I talk here about clear positions about what to achieve, if you compare to other areas of EU policy making, uh, either on environment or more generally, it has been you can see that it has been very uh, um, clear what the Swedish position has been to achieve both early on uh, with parliamentary committees and other committees looking at uh, policy development, but also in the Swedish process with goals for environmental policy where uh, on chemicals or non-toxic environment is much more concrete on what should be achieved in the EU than in some other environmental policy areas. Uh, there is also a strategy for this long-term work uh, and uh, that also involves um, things like uh, financing national experts in the European Commission, building alliances with other member states, and uh, also uh, good leadership at different levels, not only on the political level, but also on the, uh, in the administration. So uh, I think I'll soon stop here, but of course, uh, what I've been talking about here is mainly than the government level, the level of uh, authorities. Uh, this is not something that uh, uh, the change that has been achieved in the European Union that has been done by governments alone. Um, Mons Lern wrote, who was state secretary in the Ministry of Environment and later wrote uh, uh, very uh, uh, good papers, I think, for both uh, Swedish uh, uh, government commission and for Chemsec about uh, European chemical policy. He talks about the hard power and the soft power, uh, where this, what I've described, is more of the hard government negotiation power. But uh, what he speaks about there is the soft power of bringing together and facilitating a lot of different actors like progressive Swedish companies, uh, like IKEA, for example. Uh, Chemsec as uh, such, uh, partly financed by the government uh, and the other organizations uh, uh, then working together. And um, I think I will stop here from the start, but there are also things that we could discuss that uh, uh, might be weaknesses in this uh, way Sweden has worked with chemical policy within the European Union and also how chemical policy as such is is uh, dealt with within the EU and, and uh, you could claim to be a bit provocative here at the end that it is too siloed if you look at other parts of the Green Deal, there is a stronger overall commitment and there might also be a risk of being uh, too um, uh, uh, limited in if you look for example on the industrial policy or if you look at the taxonomy for the sustainable finance, if you look at uh, green diplomacy towards third countries through the external action service in the European Union. These are some areas where chemicals is not that prominent, I would say, although there are good efforts with Psychem and other global work. So uh, this is something maybe we could also discuss, discuss if you wish, this kind of areas where both Sweden and others could, could do more for the future. But I'll stop there with the introduction, I think. Thank you.